I'm Billy S, welcome to Dark Souls Month, where I'll be posting a new Dark Souls themed video every Wednesday. Today we're taking a look at everybody's favourite aspect of the series, the insurmountable bosses that plague every step of your journey. Tests of skill that showcase just how far you've come on your quest to maybe link the fire. So join me as I rank from worst to best every boss in the original Dark Souls, and be sure to share your opinions in the comments below, because newsflash, this is entirely opinion based, and my list will not mirror yours, unless you're me? At the bottom of the barrel, number 26 is the Demon Fire Sage of the Demon Ruins. It may not be the worst fight design-wise, we all know who that is, we'll get there soonish, but I don't think I have ever personally had a good experience fighting the Fire Sage. Not only is it a reskin of a reskin, but it doesn't even need to exist in the first place. The moment you beat Fire Sage, you're launched into another boss fight with the Centipede Demon, the true Demon Ruins area boss. This guy is just a glorified mini-boss with a proper health bar. Due to having the Stray Demon's penchant for AoE attacks, combined with an extremely limiting arena due to the sheer amount of f***ing branches that your character can get stuck on, it almost feels like luck whether you're able to get a good run against this guy. At least with magic you can cheese the fight to some extent, but if you're pure melee, good luck trying to get behind the boss when it backs into a wall every 5 seconds. Your reaction times need to be on point, and god forbid you don't run at full speeds. If the arena didn't have quite so many finicky hitboxes due to the branches, this boss would be a lot more bearable. It may not be the worst design boss in Dark Souls, but it's my least favourite and the one boss I think we could remove and nothing would change. What can I say that hasn't already been said about the Capra Demon and why it's absolutely reviled among Souls fans? We all know that this boss is plagued by a rather claustrophobic arena that doesn't play well with the game's camera, but I can handle that style of difficulty. What puts this fight over the edge are the two doggos. It's a 50-50 chance that you survive the opening few seconds of this fight the moment you enter. Get stunned by one of the dogs and the Capra Demon will crush any hopes of you winning in the first few moments. My strategy is to always roll like an absolute psychopath once I clear the fog gate, climb the stairs if I survive, hide on the platform, kill the dogs, plunging attack Capra, finish him off. Bish, bash, bosh. It's a shame because I like the Capra Demon's visual design and think it could have been a really threatening early game boss with a better arena. Just look at the Omen Killer from Elden Ring, which was basically a beefed up reskinned Capra Demon, and you can see the potential was always there. Open up the arena slightly and remove the dogs, you've got a solid early game boss on your hands. As it stands though, you can only have a good fight with Capra later on in the Demon Ruins. Capra Demon is why you should pick the Master Key as your starting gift so you can skip it entirely. I'm unsure as to what the consensus is for the Centipede Demon, but like the other bosses you'll see towards the bottom of my list, I just don't have much fun fighting this guy. Ever! <laughs> the entire arena is covered in lava that will kill your character quicker than you can say, subscribe to Billy S, 85% of my viewers aren't subscribed, let's rectify that. Even worse, if you're playing the original game and not the remaster, that lava glow will burn your eyeballs. My go-to strategy is always to take the path to the right, make a few tricky jumps, and reach the landmass at the back half of the arena where I can wait for the boss to approach me. My question is, why couldn't the entrance to the arena have been on that landmass? The centipede demon could still start in the lava, giving you a brief window to get in buffs, prep spells, or just psych yourself up. Instead, you have to do forced parkour, which will cause you to lose health, draining you of a few estus before the battle truly begins. It makes zero design sense. The boss most of the time will stay in the lava, just taking ranged lunges at you while you sit there praying it will come close enough for you to start wailing. If you're lucky, you can cut off the appendage containing the orange charred ring, which would allow you to then fight on the lava, but first time players aren't gonna know that. I'm never going to enjoy this fight. Enjoy 24, bitch. 
You know, I'm starting to think that I just don't like the demon ruins. The sadly named Ceaseless Discharge is a tragic figure in Soul's lore, being the only son of the Witch of Isolith, cursed with inflamed sores. He was the original wielder of the orange charred ring, though he dropped it, creating the centipede demon. Transformed into a gigantic molten giant by the flame of chaos, that's how we find him, a passive child watching over the corpse of his sister in the body of an amalgamation. In terms of the boss fight, however, he's hilariously simple. Once aggroed, you can either cheese him by doing the fog gate strategy, where you can just cause him to fall into a pit and die, or like me in this footage, you can fight him normally, which consists of rolling left, hitting his arm, rinse repeat. Ceaseless just doesn't have a varied moveset, and for his position in the game, I feel the fight should have been a little harder. Maybe give him access to more pyromancy-based attacks like his sisters, or make use of the lava spewing from his every orifice. His only real threatening attack is his fire slam, which will only be used if you're far enough away that none of his other attacks can hit you. Meaning, you will never really see it unless you do a runner. This guy gets a small boost for his tragic lore, but it's a bite I barely register or think about in-game. It just reeks of missed potential. At number 22, we have the Moonlight Butterfly of Darkroot Garden. In terms of ambiance, this is one of my favorite fights in the game. On top of this ruined, crumbling bridge overlooking the garden, it's this moonlit night, and this gorgeous jade butterfly is floating around trying to murder you. The aesthetic really sells this boss, to the point where I enjoy fighting it each time I play the game. It also shares a musical theme with good old Gwendolyn that's hauntingly beautiful. It's a shame then that the boss really does just amount to roll from the magic, roll from more magic, roll from more more magic, roll from more 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 magic. <laughs> You're waiting for such a long time for the butterfly to come down and rest, which is the only real point you can damage the boss if you're not a ranged build. And even if you do use a ranged build like magic, this boss is somewhat resistant and also finicky to hit. I always make sure to upgrade whatever weapon I'm using at Andre before heading to the Darkroot Garden so I can maximize my damage and minimize the time I spend on this boss. I'm not a fan of fights that artificially waste a player's time, nor bosses that remain purposefully out of the player's reach. If the butterfly was more consistent and just landed a bit more often, this would be a solid fight and probably in the top half of the list for me, but as it stands, number 22. I can hear the anger in the air. The first of the four Lord bosses on this list is Seath. Oof. Pero por fa, let me explain. Seath as a character is one of the most fascinating creatures in Dark Souls. He's got relations with Gwyn, Guinevere, he's heavily rumored to be Priscilla's father, and his story of betrayal of the dragons really has you wondering how intimidating this figure can be. Then you fight him, realizes he uses the curse effect, and instantly all of his stock plummets. In Dark Souls 1, there is nothing more painful in this game than being cursed. You get a 50% health deficit, you cannot reverse your hollowing or kindle bonfires, and there are very few ways to cure curse without paying a buttload of souls to merchants. It just feels like a cheap way to raise the threat level of Seath by giving him an instant kill mechanic that will catch new players unawares. Now of course for veterans, you usually will have purging stones or you just won't get cursed, but then you have to deal with a fairly lackluster moveset of swipes and crystals that feel really janky. And god forbid you try and cut off Seath's tail for the Moonlight Greatsword, this boss feels designed to track you and ensure you never have the time to get to his back tail. And in my experience, once you reach it, he'll just use his tail thrash attack and squish you instantly. Ironically, for all my bitching, he's actually quite easy to kill. It's just the optional bullshit around him, as well as a rather irritating boss run back, that makes me just not want to fight him out of the Four Lords. But I totally get why people would rank him higher. At number 20, we have my personal boss of missed potential, Gravelord Nito. When I first played Dark Souls, this lad was my hyperfixation character. I loved his aesthetic, I loved his appearance in the opening movie, I was hyped to fight Nito. <sighs> God, I was so disappointed. 
Firstly, he comes after the Tomb of the Giants, which is already an infamously frustrating area to navigate, much less boss run back. To enter his boss fight, you have to take forced fall damage, which I will always admonish. He has great design and some interesting attacks, but you never really get to appreciate those details when a skeleton is corkscrewing into you from halfway across the room. If you're a melee build, you need to ensure you can one-shot these skeleton ganks, or use a blessed weapon to terminate them for good. Magic users will have less trouble because it's Dark Souls 1 magic, obviously. Perhaps I'm the only one who experiences this, but with Nito's attacks, sometimes it feels like the hitbox on them is so off, I can just walk around him and not get hit. He leaves his back open constantly, meaning you can get off some pretty strong damage windows, with the only threat being his AoE attack. It's the only threatening thing about him, because it has such a large range. It does kill the skeletons, though. I also love and want to shout out his Gravelord Greatsword spell, where he hauntingly screams, thrusts his sword into the ground, and causes it to burst up from beneath your feet. That's so cool. His aesthetic is amazing. His boss fight just doesn't really live up to the hype for me. The missed potential is real, and that's why I'm overly harsh on him. I am fully aware that putting the Bed of Chaos anywhere above last place is a controversy. But, am I the only person who doesn't loathe fighting this boss when I play Dark Souls? Obviously, I don't like this boss, it has the worst design fight in the entire franchise, but after playing the game enough times, I know where the pitfalls in the arena are. I know what the timing is to do the final jump. I know that you have to get to oh the no. Chaos Bug as fast as possible in case you get firestormed. This is one of the few fights I can almost always predict because of its puzzle boss nature. Now, if I were ranking this list purely on a first time experience, then I'd have Bed of Chaos at number 26 and not number 19. First time players do not deserve to deal with this bullshit. Or if they do, it would be nice to include a bonfire next to the boss door so the boss run back isn't as tedious. Whether you're going from the Isolith Lava Pit or the Daughter of Chaos bonfires, the run back is not fun. We should just be grateful this fight saves our progress each time we enter, otherwise I don't think anyone would willingly finish this game. Look, I'm not going to convince you all to like this boss, I just happen to prefer fighting it to the other bosses listed prior, it's predictable and I like that, opinions and things. At number 18 we have the Stray Demon, a reskin of a much better boss. You fight the Stray Demon upon returning to the Undead Asylum and falling through the floor of the main room. Like Nito, I have to admonish the forced fall damage into this fight, but unlike Nito, the bonfires for this area are right next to the boss, so you're more likely to have all your Estus when you enter, unless you really royally fuck up. Stray Demon is the Asylum Demon with an extra AoE attack baked into it, and this AoE can be very difficult for first time players to adjust to. It comes out with next to no warning, as most AoEs in Dark Souls 1 tend to, as they often lack the animation quality of later games to let you know it's charging. You have to learn which moves end with an explosion and adjust accordingly. The AoE can also be pretty large, and you have to just sprint away and pray most of the time. Keep the demon in the center of the arena, and don't back yourself into a corner. Beyond that, hugging its booty and smacking away will win you the day, a poet. There's not much to add, it's an inoffensive fight, and unlike the Fire Sage, the arena is large enough and devoid of bullshit to get stuck on. In my most recent playthrough, I did the Stray Demon much earlier than normal because I wanted to go back to the Asylum for the Rusted Iron Ring so I could run through Blight Town without committing die. I took it down first try and felt brilliant, as in my first ever playthrough, this guy was actually a wall for me. Oh, Pinwheel. I think we all have a soft spot for this absolute goof. Let's get things out of the way. He's f***ing easy. You can probably kill him with a toothpick and no armor, but I'm mainly putting him this high for the potential and the vibe. I forget that entering his boss fight and experiencing his cutscene is really unnerving. The hanging lights, the tinkering of his experiments, the three masks, the slow turn to the player, and his music is really good, even if the first few notes are all we ever hear of it. The boss wants to be creepy, and he does his job. Give Pinwheel more health and let him be slightly more aggressive when he uses his ultimate clone attack, and you have a semi-decent boss with a cool design and moveset. 
He feels like a precursor to the Crystal Sage, but with a smaller arena so it's less annoying to run around looking for the real one. He just needed more health. Pinwheel, I'll always adore your vibes, even if you're a fucking joke. <laughs> Priscilla as a character is one of the fan favourites of this game. Banished to the painted world of Ariamis by the gods who feared and shunned her existence, she created a nice little community full of like-minded, peaceful, and kind individuals. Being optional, you have the choice to ignore her and take the plunge back to Anor Londo, but should you choose violence, battle ensues. Her boss fight lacks a lot of the pizzazz that other battles in this game have. Like Pinwheel, she has a reasonably low health pool, meaning you won't be able to properly enjoy her unique battle mechanic. Crossbreed Priscilla has the ability to vanish, and you have to track her movements using her footprints on the ground in the snow. I always got the sense that while this was a cool gimmick, it could have perhaps used a more unique arena to get the most out of it. Go full in on the stealth stalker angle. The Painted World was the first area developed for Dark Souls, as revealed in dev interviews, so Priscilla's boss design lines up more with the Demon Souls philosophy of bosses needing unique gimmicks, and her gimmick was then expanded upon and done much better in Dark Souls 3's Ashes of Ariandel with the Sister Freed fight, so Priscilla is an icon, I just feel her fight is like a prototype, and for lack of a better term, mid. <laughs> Cool scythe, though. The optional femboy of the Souls series, Dark Sun Gwendolyn is a secret battle that you can either access via Dark Anor Londo, or by wearing the Dark Moon Seance ring you can find in the catacombs. Just like Priscilla before, Gwendolyn's boss fight revolves around a very specific gimmick, and that gimmick is the arena, a seemingly never-ending corridor, an illusion shaped by Gwendolyn himself. Your aim is to chase him down, getting in as many hits as you can before he warps ahead of you, creating a loop of you running and dodging while Gwendolyn uses his ranged DPS to absolutely strike you down. It's not a terribly difficult fight, because like many bosses in Dark Souls 1, his HP pool is not that large. In this case, it actually makes sense though, as Gwendolyn is the epitome of a glass cannon, using his magic and knives to hide the fact that he's a fairly frail individual, which is why he lands above bosses like Priscilla and Pinwheel. He also has a decent challenge, as his attacks are very strong and can two-shot even the most experienced players from time to time. It's like fighting a more controlled version of Moonlight Butterfly, as in both fights, the bosses spend much time trying to avoid the player's range. This one is just more controllable, and thus for me, better. Fitting that they share a boss theme. Rounding out the lower half of this list, the Iron Golem is the epitome of a middle-of-the-road boss with no qualities that stretch in either direction, good or bad. Laying wait atop Sen's fortress, this behemoth can be quite challenging for first-time players, who can get swept up by his rather wonky grab hitbox and flung off the castle. The smaller arena forces players to play it safe, keeping their distance before going for those legs. Iron Golem has a ranged attack, but it ironically has a very short range, making it almost a non-factor. At close range, you have to avoid his stomps, sweeps, and grabs, while hacking at those ankles to stun him to the ground, where you can then wail on the boss for more damage. It takes elements of previous series fights, like Tower Knight's physical design, and the boss arena of the Man-Eaters, to provide a unique challenge that feels fitting for the end of this torturous funhouse. I enjoy this fight a lot, and I think it's one of the most well-balanced battles in the game, but that's also why it's the middle of my list. There's just nothing else to say. <laughs> Starting the upper half of my list, the first and only DLC boss you'll be seeing this low, the Sanctuary Guardian welcomes you to the Ulaseal DLC in the only way from Software knows. Beating you to death. This creature and I have a love-hate relationship. I think its moveset and design is quite intricate, far ahead of some of the fights I've listed from the main game. But it's often so fast that for strength users who have heavier weapons, there aren't many opportunities to hit nope. it. This is somewhat balanced by a rather small health pool, so four or five good whacks of a maxed out strength weapon will do the trick, you just have to actually find those openings. Imagine me, the original PC prepare to die edition. 
No DS fix, so I'm using shitty mouse and keyboard controls. A dex weapon against the Sanctuary Guardian. I rest my case. With electricity, fast combos, a poison tail, and extremely quick mobility, you can find yourself stunlocked without a chance to sip that Estus, bordering on unfair, honestly. The rest of this DLC's boss fights give you chances to heal if you play well, whereas Sanctuary Guardian just does not give you a chance. It's an extremely well-developed, if random, fight that starts off the top half of my list. The first true obstacle for many a Souls player, the Taurus Demon is the culmination of everything you've learned from the Undead Asylum and the Undead Burg, all mashed into one fun fight. You have an arena that, for new players, is tight and narrow. If you're not careful, you might trigger the boss to spawn before realizing there are two archers ready to snipe you from the tower behind you. But for everyone who's played this game before, those archers are mere set dressing for the actual fight. You can choose to fight the boss on the ramparts, or up where the archers were hanging out. For newer players, the latter is your best strategy because you have more room to move, plus if you're smart, you can plunging attack the demon before it jumps up to the tower. For veterans who want more of a challenge, fighting on the ramparts is where it's at. I love that I can tailor my difficulty to this fight, and perhaps embarrassingly, I still sometimes die to the Taurus Demon. He'll usually get me once or twice if I'm running a melee build since his footsteps do chip damage, and some of his moves are just delayed enough that my Dark Souls 3 muscle memory kicks in and fucks me over. This boss has a gimmicky arena, but it was one of the best early game experiences to overcome, and is a rare boss that I feel is uplifted by its boss run back, as those many runs through the Undead Berg's second half will have you getting back to the boss quicker and better every time. Plus, there's no beating the trauma of your first playthrough when you reach the demon ruins and you see an entire <laughs> lake of the fuckers no, no, copy-pasted no, no. at your feet. <laughs> Just missing out on the top 10, the first boss of the game, Asylum Demon, is an effective tutorial boss that has finally been given its flowers over the years. It's a fantastic oh. introduction into the world of Dark Souls, giving the players a large arena to fight in, a very slow and telegraphed moveset to avoid, and being extremely simple for returning players who want to get out of the tutorial as soon as possible. From the moment it lands in the arena, hammer at the ready and you have to flee this demon working your way around the asylum, collecting your essential gear, until you reach the balcony above it where you can plunging attack into its head causing massive damage, Cathartic does not begin to cover it. Nobody's praising this boss for being hard or difficult or unique even, but for many Souls fans out there, the Asylum Demon was their first victory in the From Software lands, and was both the gatekeeper and hurdle for the land of Lordran. Stick to those cheeks, smack that booty, and claim victory. You can do it. Then come back on New Game Plus and get that great hammer by killing it first try. Ooh. Starting out the top 10, we have the Belfry Gargoyles, the first real major obstacle for many newcomers to the series. This was the first duo fight for many out there, and I don't think this boss can be handled any better. You have the first gargoyle at full health, using its swipe attacks, its spear, and its tail to knock you off the roof and out of the running. Its health pool is fairly shallow, so your main goal is to ensure you don't accidentally roll off the arena by mistake. You can even cut off his tail for a great axe. Of course, we all know this fight for the second gargoyle that comes down with half health and serious heartburn. What I like about this fight is that you will never have both gargoyles attempting to aggressively kill you at the same time. One will always play passive and use long punishable fire breath attacks, while the other attempts to get in close and finish you off. It can be tough, as very often the gargoyle spitting fire will stop you from being able to approach the second. Fast movement and spatial awareness are your friends here, and perhaps learning not to rely so heavily on the lock-on feature. Of course, many will remember this fight as the first you can summon Solaire of Astora for, and will have very fond memories of jolly cooperation. I actually played Dark Souls 2 first, and I really enjoyed the Belfry Gargoyles fight from that game my first playthrough, so when I saw these guys, yeah, I had a soft spot for this enemy type. That's why it makes my number 10. At number 9 we have the Chaos Witch Quaylag, whose cutscene probably made a majority of the fanbase react like Britney Broski's kombucha video. So I'm a big arachnophobe. 
But for some reason, Quelag is just so monstrous, she doesn't set off any alarm bells, and I appreciate that. On top of that, I'm a flaming homosexual, so I'm not distracted by her siren charms, meaning I can just appreciate a good solid boss fight. For a first time player, you've got a lot to worry about, long reaching sword swipes, pools of lava, and an AoE that ended many of my older runs of this title. And especially at the end of Blight Town, many players are looking for something that won't ruin their day to no end. Which is actually why I like Quelag. she's not actually that hard. Her attacks are fairly easy to roll through, and her arena is large enough that you should always have the spacing to avoid her attacks. You should never be afraid to break off and run to the other side of the arena, somewhere clear of lava pools to avoid getting boxed in. There's nothing more satisfying than dropping into Blight Town with the Master Key and beating Quelag before going for the Gargoyles. She's fun, provides an excellent challenge for first timers, and a good time for veterans, even if her lore is tragic. If only we could have talked things out. Her dear, dear sister. I'm gonna level with you guys. Gaping Dragon at number 8 is purely a me pick. I know full well so many people feel this boss is just filler, since you can skip it entirely by picking the master key at the start of the game. But think back to your first ever playthrough. You're exploring this fairly subdued sewer system maze, the depths, which I will get into in my area rankings video later this month. Wink, quick, nudge, nudge, subscribe, please, por favor. Where were we? Gaping. Yeah, you find a large open arena. You know this is a boss fight. Hopefully you've defeated the channeler up on the balconies, and you enter the arena to see this little baby dragon head. And then that monstrosity emerges from the chasm, and I'm just thinking, what am I even looking at? They throw a straight up dragon at you in the early game and expect you to take that thing down. A dragon malformed and twisted by its hunger, creating many a meme in the process. I just think this fight is fun. The way the dragon swipes and claws at you, the horror of its grab attack, the way it vomits stomach acid and bile across the ground because of its hungry nausea. And it has a tail weapon that's useful to get because it cuts the boss's ability to tail swipe. Capping off an area that left quite an impression on me in my first playthrough, Gaping Dragon is just a feel-good boss that I can come back to and enjoy every time. The dev said, you thought Taurus Demon was scary? Try this dragon. You know, those dragons that were hinted in the opening movie of the game. Yeah, mm-hmm. That all the gods and the four lords had to deal with. Yeah, mm-hmm. Try that on for size. And I love it. A whole 13 bosses later from our last of the four lords, we have the bequeathed Lord Soul Holders, the Four Kings. Sealed away deep in murky depths of the New Londo ruins, these four creatures lie at the deepest pit of the world, the Abyss. You need the Covenant of Artorias to even step foot in their boss arena, giving you an interesting handicap as you can only use one of your two ring slots. This battle is a DPS check, where one at a time the four kings will spawn in, and your goal is to defeat each king before the next appears. For most people, that's not gonna happen. You'll probably find yourself swamped with multiple kings ready to pounce on you. But what this fight does really well is that only one king will ever be aggressively after you at one time. You might have another king throwing ranged pot shots your way, but generally this fight is much fairer than a majority of From Software's ganks. You have to get in close, as their attacks do less damage the closer you are, and then you also have to avoid their AoE, as well as that one ranged attack that follows you for 30 minutes, but it's completely doable. Though I do respect that for people who play like Havel, aka heavy armor, heavy shield, rolling is the death of me, kinda like my boyfriend, this fight can be very rough because you have to go to them, they don't come to you, and if you're slow, more spawn, and you get the picture. I just think their lore is fascinating, their design is gorgeous, and for some reason they're the only boss in the game to have a proper death cutscene? Just beware, for you think they lie at the deepest point of the abyss, but beneath that abyss is a slightly less dark abyss. Just missing out on my top 5, we have the final boss of the game, Gwyn, Lord of Cinder. 
and he is admittedly very propped up by his lore and the satisfaction that comes with defeating him and realizing you just beat Dark Souls, because his fight can go to two very different extremes. Either he's the hardest, most aggressive man in the world who won't let you heal, won't let you get a hit in, and takes chunks of your health like an absolute truck, a real fucking unit, the man who refuses to die. This was my original experience with Gwyn, and I got very used to that run back through the kiln of the first flame, let me tell you. Or he's the easiest boss in the game, because he is hilariously easy to parry, which is the footage you're watching because I felt like playing baby easy mode this playthrough. His threat and buildup is certainly diminished when you parry spam him, but I have to admit, it still feels good to do. He's here for the lore, he's here because that music is iconic and will never fail to make a Souls fan flip out when it's used somewhere else, I'm looking at you Dark Souls 3. Seeing this man, a shadow of his former self, desperately clinging on to the Age of Fire, it's sad, but it leaves an impression, and from a narrative perspective, caps off Dark Souls wonderfully. Get parried, bitch. And so we reach my top five, starting with the optional boss of the Artorius of the Abyss DLC, Black Dragon Calamite, the first true proper dragon boss in Souls history. Not you, sweaty. Suffice it to say, the remaining boss fights in this game are all quality, extremely worthy of any fan's time, and great battles that stand apart from the rest. Calamite is only at number 5, simply because I just struggled with him more than the rest during my first playthroughs, in a way that felt frustrating. In my first playthrough, I played a dex build, and my damage output could not compare to a strength build to the point where this was the one boss I could never actually beat. I gave up on Calamite. I didn't end up beating him for the first time until a playthrough of Dark Souls I streamed years ago on my old channel, and it felt great. Calamite doesn't have a ton of moves to remember. A few variations on the fire breath, a few claw swipes, tail swipes, a few lunges, a jaw snap, the calamity grab attack that doubles the amount of damage you receive. Uh, okay, yeah, that's more moves than I thought. But in practice, once you get a flow going, it's like a dance. A dance with dragons? First time players, this DLC is gonna kick your ass, especially Calamite. But I think with time and with experience, I find our black dragon far more manageable than he once was. He's not the best dragon boss in the series, but he set the bar and he set it high. Also that Hawkeye Goh cutscene, Oh. The poster boys for Dark Souls difficulty discussions worldwide, you knew Ornstein and Smo would be making an appearance high on this list, and that's not just because I want Ornstein to fuck me. Yeah, that line's staying in. This gank boss is the true barrier between whether you will get Dark Souls combat or throwing in the towel. Initially a fight that feels insurmountable, being the first to have two determinant phases to deal with, depending on whose health bar drops first, you're in for a challenge. Ornstein is fast, but has a shallower health pool, and would be my recommendation for who you tried to kill first, because I find second phase Smo far easier than second phase Ornstein. Smo is slower, but hits like a truck. Don't worry though, you have a patented, universally praised get out of jail free card that will make this fight so much easier. Killers. Everyone and their mum has mentioned that you can kite the pair using the pillars of the boss room to your advantage. But you know what? It works! If you can get Ornstein to use his die thrust attack that jankily forces him across the room towards you like a fucking torpedo, you can get him away from Smo and get some cheeky hits in. Just don't bother with lock on here, it'll only make this fight tougher when one of them leaves your periphery. You have to adapt and overcome both phases, it's a war of attrition, and I promise you, when you break through this boss and gain the Lord Vessel, the ability to warp, you will feel so accomplished. Almost nothing beats it, but Ornstein can beat me up any time if you know what I'm saying. If we're looking at the best fights from a gameplay standpoint, Great Grey Wolf Sif should not be number three but I am just an absolute sucker for the lore of this boss and everything that goes into its story. It just makes me adore this fight, but also loathe it because I don't want to kill them. Sif wanting to protect the grave of their master so that nobody else will be overcome by the abyss like Artorius was, 
the way they take up Artorias' sword and fight the player, but not out of malice, but to stop us from sharing his fate. The way when they get to low health and they limp towards you like a real wounded dog and you're forced to deal the finishing blow. They didn't have to add that little animation, but they did, and every dog owner who plays these games fucking felt that in their soul. It's almost poetic that Sif's fight is pretty easy, aside from the high damage output if you don't roll or shield well. You're this unstoppable force, and even Sif can't stop you. Set to the backdrop of one of Motoi Sakuraba's saddest tracks. The DLC adds extra depth to this boss, as you can rescue Sif in the Chasm of the Abyss, and even summon them to fight the endgame boss. And if you do all this before fighting them in the main game, you get an alternate opening cutscene where they recognize you, but still choose to fight. A tragedy of Shakespearean proportions. But at least Sif gets to be with their master as you go on to overcome the abyss and set things right. At number two, we have Manus, Father of the Abyss, and this was so close. Manus and my number one are easily some of my favorite fights in Soulsborne Kiro Ring, and I have the same story for both in my first Prepare to Die DS Fixless playthrough. Countless deaths, into the 50s for both, attempting and growing stronger at the game, getting better at the fights while dealing with awful keyboard and mouse controls, learning until I could best my enemies and defeat both bosses once and for all. But we're talking about Manus here. He has such a frenetic and beastly moveset, almost like a prototype for the Cleric Beast or Lawrence. He has a variety of dark-based attacks that can overwhelm the player if he didn't find the Silver Pendant in the township. But there is nothing more satisfying than seeing him winding up a spell and then countering it with this burst of magic from the pendant. But I also love that he's beatable without it, albeit a lot harder. His most infamous attack is that specific combo, you know the one, the Wombo Combo, which if you're hit even once, you just have to put your controller down and wait for it to end. And it was my favorite attack. <laughs> Unlike the Sanctuary Guardian though, Manus actually does allow for you to heal in his boss fight. You just have to avoid a few attacks and wait for a safe one. I like waiting for his big hand slam and then getting a drink in there. He really embodies his storyline, which is literally, Manus is not a morning person, someone stole his necklace, he woke up and then started screeching. Except you're facing down the giant distorted slinky hand of a xenomorph dark mage. He's intimidating, he's terrifying, but by god he feels great to fell, great to fight, and set a gold standard for final DLC bosses that From Software have yet to break. Where do I even begin? Knight Artorius is perhaps one of the most universally beloved Soulsborne characters, let alone boss fights of all time, and he is my favorite Souls character in the entire franchise. The first true tragic figure of Dark Souls series, carrying on the torch left by Demon Souls made in Astraea, he travels to Ulusil to stop the spread of the Abyss and yet he is consumed by it, fails his mission. This legend in the base game you've heard tales of was false, and it's revealed you are the true Abyss Walker who must put Artorius to rest and take on his mission, keeping his honor intact. Artorius is a broken creature when you encounter him, downright feral as he flings a corpse your way and bounds towards you with the strength of mountains, flipping, Diving, slicing, buffing, this man is a force of nature, but there's nothing natural about him. His boss fight is filled with moves that feel great to dodge, and he has a moveset that is tough to learn but feels fantastic to master. Knowing when to get your hits in, when to dodge or block, etc. This is a duel, and it is seared into my brain, every move waiting to shine each time I replay this game. The dark yet imposing music that doesn't hit you with a threatening cacophony, but a rawness, a sense of power. And Artorius is fighting you with his bad hand. That guy is a lefty. He is this powerful, this broken. Imagine fighting Artorius in his prime. They really elevate this fight as well by incorporating moves from Sif's base game boss battle into his moveset. 
giving Sif's fight an entirely new perspective as you realize the wolf has been mimicking his master. I also just think Artorius is the coolest armor set of any Soulsborne character or boss, and yes, I want him to destroy me, god, ah. Oh. But that is for another video this month. Defeating Artorius for the first time was one of the best feelings I have ever, ever had in a Soulsborne game, rivaled only by me beating Orphan of Kos in Bloodborne on my first ever attempt. I just think he's neat, and he's the perfect blend of narrative, gameplay, and difficulty. A worthy number one spot. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. I know this was a long one, but I really wanted to do it. All of my socials are on screen now, so feel free to follow wherever you feel comfortable. I have a Patreon and a Coffee account, so if you want to support the channel financially, options are available. My patrons on the left there keep this channel alive. Thank you so much. I'll see you guys next week when we rank Dark Souls 1's areas. Hmm. Bye bye.